very much, uh, Steve, for these uh, thoughts. I, I mean, you're right that I left I left subject matter out of the picture, and that may be a big uh, sort of gap here also, because I, I think to the maybe the most interesting question was the reduction part, and I sort of left it completely uh, uh, unworked out. Um, so I, I, I was discussing, uh, even just yesterday, with uh, my colleague Benjamin Spector, the, the case of the, um, of the rectangle, for instance, where you, uh, the, the, the Lusto case, right? Where you could say, if, if you say, well, the, the, the rectangle is blue when it's, 
it's just um, partly blue, right? Uh, that seems to be very close. That seems to be a case where the two the two theories meet, right? The uh, your account and the the strict tolerant account of truth. Uh, in the one case, we would say. Um, that what I was suggesting, there's a similarity relation between uh, the full extent case and the actual extent case. Um, but in your account, it's true, we, would, we could, we could uh, give an analysis on which, given a question, so given a, a subject matter, we, we, we can also find the uh, response to be informative relative to that subject matter, provided we have also uh, uh, set up the question in the, in the right way. And another example that he was giving me, which looks, I think, also um, maybe even uh, more perplexing, maybe was, um, yeah, if you say, give me that example, if, if you ask, if you ask the question, John, does John live in France? And you say, well, yes, he lives in Lyon, for instance, where, in fact, he lives in Paris. Uh, is, <laughs> that could be a case where you could say, well, it's partly true because the, 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 you can ask the question in a way that the, the, the sentence actually answers the, the, the query whether he lives in France or not, although the answer is actually false and uh, ir ir irrespective of the question. So, yeah, I think I, think I, need, to, I need to think more about the ways in which the, the two accounts uh, can, be, can be made to communicate. Um, I, I remain very, very careful about the idea that the intensive notion, I call it, of, of partial truth is, it would be reducible because I don't have an argument uh, there. Uh, yeah, so thanks, thanks, thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, I think Matteo was first. Yeah, Matteo. Matteo Plebani. Matteo Plebani. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much for your talk. I, I wanted to go back to something that you said at the beginning because I'm I've been wondering about the same thing. So when Yablo says that in order to be partly true, an hypothesis must have a non-trivial two two part. Uh, I've been wondering about what it is a trivial two part. So think about when we talk about uh, we say. In order to overlap, two sets must have a non-trivial common part. We mean uh, a non-empty common part, because the, the parts of a set are their subsets. And when we talk about the trivial partition, we talk about the partition that is a part of every partition. So the trivial hypothesis should be an hypothesis that is part of every hypothesis. And if you look at the definition of partial, this should happen only when. So an hypothesis is a, is a directed proposition. So uh, a proposition, a set of possible words that should be entailed by the any proposition. So it should be a superset of any set of possible words. And this happens only when you have W, so the set of all words. Yes. And then the, every truth maker of that proposition should be entailed by, by a truth maker of any proposition. And that happens only when, when the set of truth makers uh, is the singleton of W. Okay? Okay. And then every false maker should be a false maker of any proposition. And you can arrange that by taking the empty set of false maker. That would be uh, a directed proposition that is always true, that okay. is part of every hypothesis. But we don't want to say that everything is partially, is partially true. And therefore, we should, it shouldn't be enough that these hypotheses that is part of every hypothesis be true. And I think this 
this was my interpretation of the of the problem that you raised, and it, it seems that it works. So I'm offering it. To okay. Um, so it works even for the sort of atomic sentences that I was yeah. mentioning. It, okay. It, it works because the, every every directed proposition contains that the proposition the trivial proposition that the trivial directed proposition as a part and the trivial directed proposition is always true but okay. we want them to say okay. that okay i get it that okay. everything is is so i mean okay is, that's that's thanks that that yeah. is helpful yeah and it's related to one of the two things you mentioned this like okay contingent truth was one of the two systems equations okay okay well yeah thank, no that is that is definitely helpful Sort of, but it, then it undercuts some of the motivation, probably. For my insight. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Hi, Paul. Thank you so much. Hi, that Daniel. was one of those talks that uh, it was one of those things where, like, after you made this distinction, it just seemed so obvious that I couldn't believe that I've hadn't thought of it myself, so which is like, <laughs> like the, the exact perfect thing that the talk should do, is kind of make me feel like, why did I have to listen to that? It was so obvious, whereas before I had no idea that that was a way of doing it. But um, I, I, I wonder, um, I did, you do this thing, which you, you don't kind of fully do, but I wanted to kind of poke at you a little bit about mm. it, um, where you, which I, I see a lot of people do in a way, where you sort of say, okay, there's these different kinds of adjectives, and let's figure out which kind true is. And I mean, I just wonder, you know, the presupposition behind that is that adjectives fall into these types. And of course, like, the, the people who made these classifications, like, you know, Cruz and Kennedy and all these people, they always took paradigm mm. examples. Yeah. And I wonder whether, the way I think of things like true, or I, I write about believe sometimes, and this people talk about, is believe gradable? And has it got a similar feature? Is it like, you can talk about half beliefs and more beliefs, but you know, it's always a bit fuss, mm -hmm. fussy how it works. I, I wonder whether the right way of thinking about it is, you know, we've got these adjectives, their category might be, you know, non-scalar, but that when we have ways of conceptualizing scales associated with them, which are not like built into the lexicon maybe, but you know, uh, available cognitively, like talking about partial truths in these two different senses you had, then when we use them in these scalar sort of ways, we kind of bring online on these different so like ways of thinking about it. So it's not like true has a category, but that, you know, there's these different ways of thinking about not cl being close to true, like yeah. being true on some interpretations, but not all, or having a part in the, you know, Steve's sense in which it's true, and we sort of bring them online. So you shouldn't think of, tr so that, sorry, I'm like, not a question, <laughs> you're a rant. Um, you know, you shouldn't think of true as having a class or the kind of adjective, but, um, but, 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 but rather having these different available ways of coercing it into looking, having gradable-like properties. So to turn that into a question, what do you think about that thought? <laughs> <laughs> First of all, thanks, uh, Daniel. Um, I like the thought because it suggests that you don't have to make a choice uh, from the get-go, thinking that grammar would sort of, or let's say, or metaphysics would assign, you know, uh, univocally true to one of these classes. Um, however, I also. Toward the very end of what you said, I, I, I'm hearing the thought that it, it might be less pluralistic than what I was just reporting, namely that uh, tr tr true is really a um, categorical notion, and then it is coursed into uh, one of the other notions that I was describing. Is, was that what you were saying? I don't, that would be far too precise for my mind. <laughs> uh, I was thinking of simultaneously having two different thoughts. One was that true is underspecified, and one is that your other thought, and I was kind of um, diving between these two notions. Mm. Um, but, but I hadn't decided which one would be best or even fully articulated the difference. But yeah, I mean, I, I mean just to... Uh, yeah, I mean, just to... It's, it's, so we, we don't use 
partly true that much in casual conversation, but we understand it fairly well, even like non philosophers understand. One thing that I, I was mm. completely clear in like Steve's examples is like this is part of like you know our kind of ordinary conceptual apparatus, not just what you use in the seminar room. And I mean, you definitely use it in, the, in, I mean, both these senses, as yeah. you point out. And so, but, but they have like very different characteristics, too. Like something you pointed out, which I think is a really nice uh, test about partial truth, is if you have partial truth in the partial sense, the sentence is unassertable. Like, so if yeah. something is partly true, it, it's kind of like pretty, I, you know, if it's, a, if it's a conjunction, at least in the normal cases, if it's a conjunction and, you know, one of the conjuncts is false, it's unassertable. Yeah. Whereas it's very assertable in, the, in the, you know, your tolerant treatment of vagueness, which is, I think, how we use vague terms. So, so that you have, like, a clear, like, way of testing between yeah. the two of them, yeah. which I thought was a nice... Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, no, the, the, I, I, thank you, actually, for highlighting that part, because uh, I, I also think that this is where the, the two notions sort of uh, split. Um, and as I said, you're right. So that was the point I was trying to highlight with the conjunction case, that the, for a conjunction to be tolerantly assertable, both conjuncts um, need to be tolerantly true. And so if one of them is uh, not tolerantly true, as you said, yeah, things, th th things won't work. Although the sentence uh, could remain partly true exactly uh, in the sense uh, of Steve, uh, I think, in this case. But I, I, since I've, I've ignored the notion of subject matter, I, my confidence is sort of a lowering now. Uh, I need, because I need to think more about the, the suggestion uh, Steve was making. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Yes, Sally. Thanks. Yeah, I'm Sally Hasslinger. Um, so again, mine's coming from sort of a, a different angle, but okay. I, I think this might be useful um, for some of the cases. So Nob and Prasada have developed this idea of a dual character concept. Yes. And so you're a scientist, but you're not a real scientist because although you fit certain sort of, you know, you have a job at MIT and you work in a lab and whatever, you're not a real scientist because you don't hold, you don't, as, uh, meet certain ideals of pursuing the truth for its own sake or whatever like that. And so it seemed to me that um, one way to think about this, in so, at least in some cases, might be, well, um, like in the court of law, you're supposed to speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And so you could yeah. say of someone like Clinton, he spoke the truth, but not the real truth, because there's an ideal of truth or a standard of yes. truth in the court of law so there's a kind of dual character here. Yes. There's the minimum, and then there's there's the legal requirement of truth, and and so he didn't meet that standard of truth. And you might think that there are different standards in different contexts for what is the real truth. Um, so in scientific inquiry, you might think, well, you need to have significant truth. It's not just some trivial, you know, stupid grew fact or something like that. And so you've got this this set of a, of, of a contextually specified ideal of, of what you have to achieve. And then so you can say in these various cases, well, it was true but not completely true or not really true or whatever against that in the way that they do for, uh, for dual character concepts. Yes, yeah. Just a thought. Thanks very much, Sally. It's, uh, it is nice because there are two things there. One is the fact that true uh, applies to more things than also uh, sentences. So you could say a, a true and then express a property. Yeah. Um, in the case of the Nob and Prasada case, um, I find this really interesting because I think there's the same um, there's the same gradient. Um, so true. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so true. <laughs> so you, 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 can, uh, you can wonder if you think that have, being a true blah, blah, blah is having, um, having 
all of the properties defining of, uh, or characteristic of, uh, of, of, let's say, being a driver or being a s s something X, or you could still be an X if tolerantly if you have only if some of these properties. And uh, so I think there the apparatus would still, you know, be completely applicable. First thought. Um, and then uh, about the, the Clinton case, I think the when I started actually thinking about the case, I was very surprised because I think, uh, of course, I think he lied, right? And the, the sense in which I think he lied is because I think the the relevant sense of uh, having a sexual relation is not the sort of gerrymandered uh, sense that was actually used in the court. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so at best, it is a half-truth, obviously, because it, and the sense in which it's not completely true is exactly because we need to, in, uh, we need to include, as you say, all the uh, other relevant senses, which include the ordinary sense as a prevalent sense. So I d definitely agree so with it, you there. I mean, I think what's... So as you say, you're going to be a true, draw, a true scientist. In a real, and they talk about the difference between being, you know, it's, it's true that you're a scientist versus you're a real scientist. And I was, and so there's this idea of being a true scientist or a real scientist. And that you have to meet some kind of standard. It's interesting because I was thinking that true itself has these different standards, not just scientist has its standards, or, or sexual relations has this standard, but true itself has a standard, mm. that the degrees of truth differ depending on the context you're in. So in a court of law, there's a different standard for truth yes. than when you're in these other contexts. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I, I, I... I agree with that. I, I could say more, you know, uh, Lewis also wrote about True Enough in one of his uh, yeah. uh, papers. Um, and I view his uh, the discussion of True Enough as actually being very uh, consistent with that idea of uh, the standard also being context sensitive, as you say. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Gideon Lewis. Um, in some of the cases you discussed, like um, a set of a borderline case, it is and it isn't red. Um, if we've managed to make salient the tolerant notion of truth, that should be just fine, right? The conjunction or the disjunction. It's red and it isn't, or it's red or it isn't. They should be as good as it gets because both parts of the sentence are fully tolerantly true. Um, people who like a straight up fuzzy account sometimes like it because those accounts often predict that these sentences have the same intermediate status as mm. this straight predication of the borderline case. And they claim there's empirical evidence that people treat the conjunctions or the disjunctions as, you know, not great, but assertable in the same way that it's red instead of a borderline case yes. is um, not great, but sort of assertable. So is it a virtue of the straight fuzzy accounts that they predict an intermediate status for these odd assertions? I would think so, because so you're the... There are difficulties or subtleties, but I would think so. The, so the, Short answer is yes, because indeed, if you these borderline contradictions are assertable to an extent, then just flat out uh, clear falsities are not. Um, however, the, the difficulty is that they're not quite as good, right, as a, as perfect truth. Um, so usually, uh, the difficulty I was mentioning is that. Um, if you say um, John is tall and not tall, let's say you, you won't 
be able to say John is tall. Uh, so that's some observation that you know Akhratib and Pelletier were making that you, it's not easy to eliminate conjunction out of the blue. If if John is tall and not tall, can you infer well? Therefore, John is tall, well, because we, we tend to hear John is tall as going by default with the with the stricter notion, right? But we need definitely some room for the assertability of being tied to the intermediate degree. And actually, in the sort of three-valued account, uh, the three-valued version of the account I was suggesting, we didn't, not, we didn't start out with you know, degrees. We started with this existential uh, universal quantification apparatus. Um, in fact, you can simplify the semantics and give these three-valued semantics where the intermediate degree corresponding to the borderline assertability is exactly uh, uh, something um, uh, consistent with a fuzzy account. Uh, it would be a degenerate fuzzy account with only three degrees of truth. Yeah, thanks. Simkin. Um, uh, this is kind of a methodology question. So I was interested in the, the relation, the, the way you try to capture the tolerantly, strictly distinction as duals in terms of uh, conjunction under, under existential quantification and conditionality under universal quantification. And um, um, in the these definitions, of course, uh, it's part of the, the exponents that we have classical truth in a model. And the question for me is just, is this supposed to, because we're talking about atomic cases here, so is this supposed to be a, um, just an artifact of the model in Kaplan's sense, or is it supposed to be something that actually has some significance for you? That, that classical yeah. truth in a model is actually at the bottom of this when we try to explain whatever. You know, you can raise the same questions about about in supervaluationism, about precisifications, and there there's also a you can ask about whether precisifications, the range, how is that fixed? Is it pragmatic things that go in there? And then maybe we can go on and it's actually two questions. Whereas here it will be something whether certain pragmatic considerations enter into similarity relation yes. that you also have as part of the exponents. Yes. Thanks, thanks. Uh, that's uh a very uh, relevant question. So when we started this uh, project with uh, my co-author, so the definition of strict and tolerant truth was the one I was giving you, right? Uh, with uh, classical models and this existential universal quantification using similarity relations, um, it turns out the definition can be turn into a three-valued uh, definition of straight and tolerant truth in which you would dispense with the notion of classical truth um, and you would uh, say, well, there are clearly true cases, clearly false, and ones in between, and if you take indeterminacy then to be a primitive notion, you can still define strict and tolerant in terms of those. Um, so David Ripley did this first simplification, actually, Suggest and was very happy to dispense with the you know classical apparatus that was behind this, suggesting it's actually not essential at all. Um, and in discussions, though, I've had with a grand priest, uh, you know, because there could have been another talk where you know uh, I was initially also planning to go into discussing whether some paradoxical sentences. Uh, are also not uh, a good test case for, for Steve's theory, but for the kind of distinction I was mentioning here. So sentences that would be intrinsically or inherently um, half true. Um, so for those, the question is, um, can, you, can, you, can you preserve the initial framework I was giving? So the short answer is that I think, I, I think a beauty of the original framework for strict and tolerant truth I was giving is that I think it does some explanatory work with the existential and universal quantification in a way that I think Steve's uh, account also of partial truth does explanatory work. If you introduce you know, degrees indeterminacy from the get-go, I'm not sure you retain the same explanatory virtues of the theory. 
Um, of course, you um, you get uh, you get the benefit of not having to commit to classical, you know, sharp lines and so on. Um, and I, I went a little back and forth about this, uh, including in discussions with priests, because I, I have I, I say that there are things which are true and not true, in a sense that is very consistent with what Dalithists say about truth. But then if you translate that view in the original framework, it doesn't sound very consistent because you just seem to be saying that you're changing perspectives or comparison points. Um, yeah, so the, the honest answer is that I'm still, I'm still yeah. going a little bit back and forth about that. Just, uh, just quickly, so, and with respect to the second issue, the, how the similarity relation gets determined. Uh, oh. Yeah, well, the, there I think what Sally was, was mentioning is very uh, correct, that it's uh, very context sensitive, right? Yeah. Uh, and so there's no, the problem is the same that was for supervaluationism in the early days, right? What counts as an admissible precisification? Uh, likewise, what counts as a, you know, similar enough for you know, the tolerant meaning to be ascribed, I think is very context sensitive. and. Uh, yeah, I, I think Dan was so also sort of suggesting something along the same lines, and I agree with that. Thanks. You're welcome. I have to check Zoom. No question on Zoom. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.